Hello, listeners. This is Tegan Marshall from Vancouver Island University, and I'm talking. And what this show is, is the Canadian Philosophy Show. Tonight's topic, or rather, thesis defense segment, is the statement, people with disabilities have the same desires and, and needs for relationships, whether that be romantic or platonic, as everybody else. However, the romantic nature is often um, neglected or not even acknowledged in society. So as a precursor to what I'll get into in a few minutes, let me introduce my co-host for this evening. First, we'll start with Michael Robert Kadich from VIU. Why don't you tell us an interesting, fun fact about yourself, Mike? <laughs> I uh, <laughs> like to cycle uh, 20 kilometers a day. Mikey, the workout champ. Let's go. I do two kilometers and I'm done. Okay, so with that in mind, we're pedaling on over to Nicole. Nicole, why don't you share an interesting fact about yourself? I'm going to stay along the same kind of lines here, and I'll say that uh, Michael has inspired me to look into cycling, and I want to say I... I the bike market right now is crazy. It's absolutely crazy. You can't you can't buy like any bike almost right now. I I if you want to buy a bike, it's like anything that's you know above you know like a a really entry grade one. It's just impossible right now. So I'm like kind of looking for bikes, but I can't find anything. So thank you, Mikey, for getting me into this sufferable, I guess, <laughs> hobby in this sense. But I think it'll be fun if I end up getting a bike. So thank you. Well, folks, you heard it here first. Nicole has biked the bullet. I repeat, she has biked uh -huh. the bullet, and she's entering the biking world. So congratulations on that accomplishment, Nicole, and congratulations on being an inspiration, Mikey. All right, so, and thank you to all of you for listening. Let's begin. I already gave the theme of today's episode away a little bit. Uh, in fact, I did. But here we go again. In fact, bicycles are a great analogy because is there nothing more romantic and also weird than the 70s and 80s image of a couple riding a tandem bicycle into the sunset? Indeed. Believe it or not, that's not something I've experienced. So I... I I, to each his own, you know? It's just not my preferred method. Okay, so with, with, with jokes aside, um, moving on to today's topic. I chose this topic because, uh, well, it's near and dear to my heart, um, the desire for a relationship and stuff like that. But as I was thinking and as I've, thought about how this is portrayed throughout the years, it, it's become apparent that there seems to be some misinformation or lack of knowledge or just ignorance or even willful ignorance and maybe even some societal conditioning um, when it comes to people with disabilities and their desires for romantic relationships. As I said, the statement I made earlier that people with disabilities have the same, you know, desires and need, you know, desires and hopes for romance as anybody else seems pretty straightforward. Um, you know, seems like everyone can get behind that from face value. But my my question lies with um, how well that is actually, how well those needs are, are known and how well they are supported and even accepted within society itself. Um, and so tonight, um, I want to cover a couple things. I want to cover, um, maybe my personal experience a little bit and how, how um, I perceive things and, 
and how I've experienced some things. I also want to talk about the representation of relationships, primarily interabled relationships. So um, one partner who has a disability and one partner who does not, um, and how that's portrayed in media, uh, particularly film. And I have two films I'll be referencing um, throughout the program. And then uh, finally, we'll be talking about um, some of the excerpts from the, if we get there, um, possibly discussing the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy's entries on relationships, human relationships and romantic relationships as well. So I think you're in for an interesting evening, especially if you're a hopeless romantic like myself, but that does bias me to enjoying these kind of fluffy fluff conversation. But um, trust me, it won't be all fluff and fluff. So Mikey, Nicole, are you ready? No. Nope. Is that the answer? <laughs> hey, well, if you ask a hoping... question, you have to accept our answers. I'm not ready. Nicole's not ready. So you got to get us ready. Well, there you go. That's what I'm here for. So let's go. So we'll start with me because that's the best point of reference. So being a 20-year-old, 20 20 almost said 21, I'm not that old yet. I still have a few days of, uh, a little while of youthfulness left. No, I'm kidding. Um, being a 20-year-old, um, obviously... Um, the the desire for relationships is especially for me because as I said I'm a hopeless romantic heck anyone who knows me knows I'm basically just a big ball of cheese if it took human form um, because every reading break I have I have a de designated romance movie profile on my Netflix and I use reading break to read but also to catch up on my romance films. So obviously, obviously, it, it's something I, I care about and desire. Um, but, as I it it does raise an interesting question, because you can watch all the romance movies all day long about how, you know, um, you know, the stereotypical, right, per, Hallmark, type style person moves into a new town meets you know the attractive guy or whatever uh, and and they have a fling and then there's some kind of crisis and so then but love conquers all the thing is we all can point to one example probably where that doesn't work where that's just not the reality that's the reality we wish relationships could be like. So that's kind of a common portrayal. But what gets left under unnoticed is the way that society looks at people with disabilities and relationships. And, you know, one of the things, as I was doing research for this episode... Um, that came apparent is sometimes there's this idea, it's not a common idea, but sometimes there's this idea that people with disabilities um, just identify as asexual, and so that's that's not, not part of it. But I found an article um, that said, you know, yeah, there is a small percentage of people who may identify as that, but for the vast majority, it, that is just not the case. Um, more commonly, and this is kind of why I want to talk about the media and stuff, is just it is not socially prevalent, which, I mean, is understandable to an extent, um, because um, depending on the you know, severity of the disability that an individual might have, right? It may, they may just not be 
right? That that idea is not as prevalent in their community. Um, but then, of course, there's also the flip side of you know entering a relationship with a person with a disability, and you know there there's there's conversations that need to be had in terms of depending on the severity. So like for me, right, I'm having the spastic quadriplegia. Although I can, you know, I can I can talk for hours nonstop, hence why I'm on the radio, right? Um, even though I can do that, there are some, you know, my, my functionality outside of my wheelchair is very limited. Um, so it's, you know, I need to be transferred in and out of bed every day. I need, I need help, you know, getting ready for the day in basically every capacity. So, so there is certainly a different commitment, but I will, I will definitely get to those because that's an important conversation, um, that, um, I think gets overlooked. Points. Um, so yeah, so we'll we'll get there. Um, but first, um, I want to talk about um, yeah, I've talked about society a little bit, but I also want to just talk about because we all know that that media influences at least to some capacity the the culture and the society we live in right um and 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 therefore changes the 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 outlook that people may have and as a disabled person um who likes romance movies and all that jazz i can tell you there's not too many that that really celebrate um or even acknowledge necessarily a person's need, a desire for relationship um, in terms of the romantic department. Um, one one movie that that I enjoy despite the ending it is based off of a novel, and, and that movie's title is Me Before You. So the movie centers around a, a I can't remember his name his name now. No, his age, sorry. But centers around centers around Chris, I believe is his name. And the the story of him who was actually paralyzed in a after being hit by a motorcycle, right, and and comes from this wealthy family and everything, um, becomes paralyzed, and, and so is confined to a power wheelchair and stuff, and his parents are looking for a care attendant for him, so someone to you know help him with the things he needs help with, and so. They go through a bunch of applicants, and then, um, then finally they they get to Amelia Clark, who plays Louisa. Louisa is this kind of misfit, kind of really quirky, really lighthearted kind of kind of young woman who who applies for the job and and. Initially, initially, oh, sorry, it's Will Trainer. That's what it is, Will. Apparently, initially, Will is kind of like very kind of, you know, kind of down on himself, kind of struggling with depression, right? Because he obviously can remember the life he had before, before the accident. Um you come to discover that his former his former girlfriend after the accident had left him and actually hooked up and, and married in the course of the film marries one of 
Will's old business partners. Um, and her justification for that is that he just pushed her away, and so that was that. And so this leads into an interesting conversation of how do I look at people or how, what would be my thoughts on people who, um, you know, were in a relationship or were married who then experience a tragic accident, which then leaves them with a permanent disability? It's a fair question. My, my answer to that is that, A, it's not easy. I'm not going to say it's easy. Because it points to, it forces a relationship to transition from where, from a place where, you know, they may be both working, um, both really successful, to one of the partners having to basically take on that full-time caregiving, take on those Oper- you know those challenges, and what what I would what I would say is, although the transition is difficult, the transition is not impossible. Um, because although that person's circumstances have changed, and because of that, the individual may have may have, you know, some difficulty adjusting, right? That's a challenge where, at least for me, you know, because I can't really speak to this. This is just me, you know, being all hypothetical, as philosophers do. Um, right? that, that, that individual, right, the love that that individual has for you may remain, but if they can't feel good about themselves because they're depressed, because they're trying to figure out what, how to navigate this, right? If, if they can't be in a positive headspace themselves, it's going to be substantially harder for them to show um, their gratitude and appreciation. And I think that's where um, communication is really necessary. But um, you want to quickly uh, open the floor and just see if any of my co-hosts have a comment before I move forward. It's okay. Well, um, oh, it. go ahead, Mikey, please. Yeah, uh, back to your uh, thesis about... Uh Society often doesn't recognize that disabled people have the same needs for romance and intimacy and so on in relationships as other people. How, how would that follow? How would you construct an argument opposed to yours? Yeah. Can, can, I, you can I um, jump in? Just to s- I just want to say that like, that's not a, like the, a thesis has like an argument part, right? Portion too. I, I, I want to say I noticed it too. So... Go ahead, Michael. Sorry. What would be an argument that a person who was disabled in some way did not have the same needs for relationship and romance? Mm -hmm. Why would that even be considered as an argument? Well, it would be considered because it, it, it is not a... It is not a common thing which is promoted or exhibited within society. It is also not generally a topic which is discussed um, because it's a personal thing. And so, and almost as I said before, right, due to the, you know, possibly the severity of the disabilities, there may be an assumption that that person is incapable of having a meaningful romantic relationship. When 
you talk about people with disabilities. Isn't that a very broad uh, swath yeah, of sure, uh, people? I, I mean, I there's can, different type. Sure, I can limit the scope for you. So people with physical disabilities can sometimes be seen due to their portrayal in media um, and lack of recognition within society. Assumptions can be made that they are either not wanting or not, not, not able to have a romantic relationship in the same way just because there's not as much in terms of um, awareness for the issue. Are there uh, some types of disabilities that would prevent uh, someone from um, having sex with a partner? Sorry, Mike. Unfortunately, I got to turn my got to turn things up here. Unfortunately, the only thing I heard in there was basically sex. So, can you repeat the question? Are there? some disabilities, obviously not all, is there a type of disability or are there some types of disabilities that would make it impossible for a sexual relationship with um, a partner? You know, none, none that come, you know, directly to mind. I mean, I can see there possibly being some issues um, like if the person has... Like, I don't know, because it's all about how muscles are affected, right? So, well, I can, I can answer. I can say that, like, obesity can cause, like, that issue can cause erectile dysfunction, right? And that could be considered, in a way, a disability that prevents a sexual relationship. Sorry, Nicole, did you say spasticity? No, obesity. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah like, I, like, morbid obesity, right? That could yeah, be I guess that's, that's possible, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so what if somebody's like paralyzed and can't feel anything from the waist down? Yeah, so, and actually that's interesting because there is an interabled couple that I follow that, that does address that. Generally, that, that, that does not prevent um, sex from occurring. It, it just results in a lack of being able to feel that stuff right? but that's also where in terms of physical intimacy um you know that is where each individual couple really has to rely on that step-by-step -step communication um and basically trial and error as well to figure out what's going to work best for them okay so as to your um scenario that you raised earlier tegan about uh what if uh somebody's injured like so they're after the relationship's already established right somebody ha gets some disease or injury which uh, then uh, disables that person in some way mm -hmm. and then i'm going to add to that and let's say that it um, impedes or severely limits um, or at least dramatically changes the uh, sexual relationship between each person right so now the partner um, the uninjured one or the unimpeded one suddenly is faced with uh, a changed relationship, as you pointed out, where um, the partner would need to accept, uh, a, let's say, a significant change, if not a complete elimination, but let's say a significant change in, um, in uh, the uh, intimate, sexual, physical part of the relationship. So in your view, um, and I'm just yeah. asking you, it's not a, this is not a rhetorical question. It's a yeah, legitimate, no. yeah. In your view, Tegan, um, could that be a legitimate reason for for the uh, partner of the person who is whose physical status changed to end the relationship? Because what if the partner said, you know, like our sex life or my sex life is very important to me. I'm only, you know, 22 right. years old and uh, uh, I want to have an active sex life and I want to have children down the road. And now that's going to be very difficult for me beca uh, because of the uh, change that's happened. Mm -hmm. So in your view, Tegan, would, would that or could that be a legitimate reason for uh, to end the relationship or uh, to uh, or is there some other solution? 
Yeah, so I think I think Mikey raised an interesting point, but I think I would I would clarify that that as as I kind of said to my knowledge, there's very few disabilities that would completely um, eliminate the ability to have a sexual encounter. So I I don't on those grounds I don't think it's necessarily strong, but also. Um, you know, I guess we need to have a discussion. We would, I guess I would say, in my view, a relationship, if it is a true relationship, um, right, and this comes partially out of my philosophy of personal relations course, um, right, a true relationship, a close personal relationship is defined as one where you desire to be in a relationship with that person for who they are and not just the traits they possess. So I, I would say that the the statement that my sex life is important to me, therefore we need to have this conversation, um, right? I, I don't necessarily think that that recognizes the entirety of that person. I think that that, rec that recognizes a benefit of the relationship, but I, I would almost say quite strongly, if a relationship is strictly based on, you know, sexuality and sexual expression, um, then I have to question how deep the the commitment uh, to each other is. Yeah, uh, but... Tegan, I think that's from your from, from your biases, right? Like you can have um, a very very sexual relationship that is very committed, that is very um, that is. Uh, very wholesome, right? Those two aren't uh, aren't mutually exclusive, and um, I think your biases might be showing a little bit in this regard. I just want to point like point that out or or ask the question if that is the case. So what what do you think my bias is, Nicole? I think I'm, you I'm have just a, curious. Well, I don't want to like I don't want to say it on the air, right? If it's a if it's personal, so but, like. I mean, I, I appreciate... Well, there's, there's a religious part, right? right. There's, but there's fair also enough. a personal part too, right? right. That I yeah, know about. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, okay. So I, I can appreciate that. What, what I would say is... Okay, so back to that point. And uh, back to that point. I, I, I do appreciate that reflection, Nicole. Thank you. Um, but to that point, I would say... I would say, though, that there needs to be, right, although it is a traumatic experience to go to that kind of shift, right, I think um, if, yeah, I mean, definitely for me personally, I would, I would feel quite, quite, you know, hurt if, if the, if the, because in that question, right, in that scenario, it seems like the basis of, of that relationship appears to be the primary concern is, is you know. No, not, well, not necessarily, right? Like, there can be, like, the, the, the whole sum of it is, like, it could be a, a, the parts of the relationship, right? Right. There's, you know, I, I'm not you know, in a relationship with somebody just for one reason or another reason, it says some of all yeah. the reasons, right? And, um, and I choose to be with that person because of the sum of all the reasons. Um, and yeah. if one of those reasons is gone, right, then, you know, the, the initial reason I went with that per when in a relationship with that person isn't necessarily the same as when I first, you know, decide to be in a relationship with them, right? So right. Um, it's, I think there's there's multiple reasons why you could be in a relationship with somebody. There often are multiple reasons. Um, I would yeah. say there's you know except if it's you know a uh, you know a, a Tinder matchup where you're just going to hook up yeah. with somebody or whatever. You know like like the stereotypical stuff like that, right? Yeah. There's there could be that kind of example, but in a committed relationship, there's often multiple reasons you're with yeah. somebody, and all those yeah. reasons are important, right? So I, I kind of want to call that into question a little bit. That, that that assumption, but I, I have taken. I do respect where you're coming from, also. I mean, I I appreciate that, but I, you know, as I said, I I I 
I think going back to just how I would respond to that scenario outside of, you know, questioning kind of the basis of the relationship, I would say that's definitely something that, that um, the couple should, should honestly discuss. Um, obviously, I, you know, obviously you're quite right, Nicole, that, that I am biased towards the fact that, uh, that, um, I would, I would prefer, um, I would prefer to try and stick it out, you know, but, um, I think that's ultimately, um, a conversation that, uh, that, that couple needs to have and work through and, and to, to have that conversation of, okay, although things look different, although things m definitely are different, right? Yeah. I am still that individual. And even though, like, I'm just saying what I would say, if, if I was, you know, if I was not already in the position, right, I would, I would probably open that dialogue by saying, you know, thank you for, you know, like being open and honest about that. Um, and, and I would just try to express how I was feeling in that moment, um, how much I care for them, um, how much I, I can recognize that this sh shift is difficult for them. And that, that I would, you know, I would like to try and continue and work it out and adjust the relationship. But, um, I also realized that uh, that that's more a long form discussion on on that topic of how you would how you would deal with that um, because it because I would say I would say as much as I will always advocate to remain as much as possible I would say um, there's definitely unique challenges to what disability it may be. Um, what, whether it is um, cognitive or whether it is physical or whether it is um, whatever that is, right? So I don't know if that really answers your question, Nicole, but but I, I would I would say that or Mikey for that matter. Um, but I would say that the that it it demonstrates right the the need for that couple to have to be in a constant state of what Hugh LaFollette calls a um, state of revealing themselves to each other. Um, so having that authenticity uh, to say, hey, you know, my sex life is important to me. Um, but then also, um, I would say, ha trying to promote the option of, okay, let's see how this works now. Um, right, trying to see if there's an alternative to saying, you know, let's end the relationship. I would always say that that's a better first step, but I also can't deny that for some people, um, that is going to be the end result. So, I I don't know if that answers that question there. I was just uh, thinking that. Um... Uh, I would want to be careful to uh, avoid a slide into dualism here. So uh, a couple things concern me. One is the suggestion that uh, that humans have a physical side mm. and then a <laughs> non-physical side, and the and 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 who a person really is is the non-physical mm -hmm. part. And the physical part is just sort of uh, icing on the cake or is uh, peripheral. Yeah, fair um, enough. Yeah. yeah, so I, I, I would challenge that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that that was your claim explicitly taken, but, uh, but I'm just no, saying. I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm just saying that I would want to avoid um, that because in my view, uh, people are integrated and their personalities mm -hmm. and their values and their past experiences and their qualitative states and uh, their right. morality or lack of morality and their physical being, they're all, the, as Nicole was suggesting, the sum total of all that is the person. So it wouldn't be right to say that who you really are is not your physicality or, or your sexuality. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I, I agree. Oh, go ahead, Mikey. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, the the second uh, the second thing related to that wanting to avoid a slide into dualism is that um, uh, if it's it's I forgot my train of thought. Go ahead, Tegan. I'll, I'll follow up on okay. that in a minute. Yeah, yeah I, I would actually like to respond yeah. to that concern of sliding into dualism. Um, because, yeah, I, I think that physical is obviously an integral part of, you know, what makes me me. It may not be the entirety, obviously, because I have a personality. I'm not, I'm not just a body, right? But I, I, think, I think, Mikey, you're right, because... You know, what What we see in that movie, I was talking about me before you, right? Will Trainer goes from this, you know, really, you know, the superstar kind of guy. Everyone wants to be him. Everyone, everyone, you know, everyone loves him. Everyone wants to be him. Everyone, yeah, just, just wants to be that guy because he's the it guy. He's successful. You know, he's attractive. He's all that. And... You know, when when he has his accident and throughout the course of the movie, he he cannot adjust his perception of himself. Um, you know, in fact, there's there's a scene there that that they've gone on this kind of big big trip, this this big trip to kind of lift his spirits. Um, we won't get into this topic today, but I, I will say that part of the precursor for that trip is, is because they're trying to convince him out of going to Sweden to have a lethal injection. Um, so he, he's, he's really struggling to find his place, to, to find who he is. And, I mean, on one hand, although I strongly disagree with with kind of his motives of just saying you know i don't want to live like this therefore i'm out of here um i i would say in a sense i can kind of i can kind of be a little sympathetic to what he says near the end when he says um you know, I, I just don't want to be a burden to my parents or you. Um, and, and, and and that's part of his hesitation with them um, actually entering into a full official relationship with this caregiver. It's because he, 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 that's also why it's me before you, is it's, I'm, I'm going to go so that you can be, you can be all that you want to be. Um, and, you know, we can have a discussion about the, 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 the reality of that and whether that's accurate. But I can kind of empathize with him there a little bit because that's definitely a concern that I have had um, when I've thought about pursuing relationships um, is the fact that I wouldn't want to hold my significant other back from reaching their goals, um, you know, reaching their full potential. That's the last thing I want to do. Yeah, so on the topic of a uh, slide into dualism, uh, the other point I wanted to make was that um, it would be useful to define disability because uh, it's almost as though we're talking about disability as necessarily a physical limitation, right. but um, ima uh, imagine um, other scenarios where say somebody is, uh, has some sort of mental disability, uh, cognitive disability, but we can come up with all kinds of possible disabilities. What if somebody can't speak? What if somebody mm -hmm. can't, what, what if somebody has emotional disabilities? What if somebody can't empathize? What if somebody can't love? What if somebody can't listen? What if uh, somebody uh, has a, a moral disability, right, and has no, no ethics and no morality? There's all kinds of reasons why uh, uh, someone may not want to be in a relationship with that person, and, uh, and other people might want to be, right? So everyone's different, and, and, and if we, if we uh, accept the thesis that Nicole and I were proposing, which is that 
who a person is is the sum total of all their parts, mental and physical, or, or, or you know, or maybe it's all physical, right? right. But um, uh, then, then, then there's all kinds of reasons, considerations. A person has properties, right? A person has various characteristics right. and properties, and they have strengths and weaknesses, and they have abilities and disabilities. They, someone might be very, very strong and quote unquote perfect or the ideal physical form, but may be unable to communicate yeah. or empathize or, or, uh, or, um, or, or love another person. So that might be considered a disability. So, uh, but certainly before I would enter into a relationship with someone, I would want to take into account all of, the, of those things. Now, we, you know, you, you know, we watched a, a short YouTube video which uh, depicted uh, you know, a young, beautiful woman uh, married to a, uh, a young, um, a d disabled, uh, sort of disfigured um, uh, uh, man, and she was very much in love with him, and he was very much in love with her, mm -hmm. and so that's great because uh, uh, the relationship met each of their needs. Uh, so some people might uh, get their needs met by a relationship with someone who had certain physical limitations and would not get his or her needs met by being in a relationship with someone who didn't have the capacity to empathize or to to care right. or and, to love. And I think you bring up a good point, Mikey, uh, because now, um, because, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to tote myself as, you know, being all that in a bag of chips because I'm not shocked. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not. But but I think you raise an interesting point because people with disabilities, whatever that is, bring a unique perspective which is not necessarily common um, to to society. Um, whether that is a more cognitive or physical, right? The perception of the world is different, and so I think for someone possibly they they may be attracted to that aspect um to the as a part of them right um the fact that they have those experiences and that they have a unique outlook right one of the things that i've come across when i've i've watched several different interabled couples um on the internet is and they always say, you know, confidence is key, right? Um, you know, it's not le acknowledging that the chair or the cognitive challenge or whatever it is, is part of you. It's, it's as Mikey and Nicole are saying, is that's just an indisputable fact. Um, it's, it's just not for dispute. Um, but not allowing that to be the definitive aspect um, of how you know how you see yourself um, and, and therefore but can I say what about how others see you because you can't you yeah, can't dictate yeah, how yeah, others yeah, see no you fair. right yeah yeah no fair mm -hmm. I, I agree with you there and that's that's frankly the challenge um, that's um, I mean that's the challenge for everyone right but I think I feel it a little more because partially it's something that I really, really desire, something I really want, um, that that I always wonder when when I do get, you know, turned down, which is totally fine, you know. But I always wonder a little bit, you know, would that happen if I was not disabled? Right? Because the the in, in the case of a physical disability, right, is that's just right there in the open. <laughs> you you can't get away with it um, versus my fetal alcohol diagnosis, right? You can't tell that. You can't tell that, but you can tell that my legs don't work. Um, and therefore, that person has the ability to then conjure in their mind all these different things, right, which, which may be accurate. But then that factors into their decision. So, could I bring up but, the film that yeah. uh, that I watched called the Yeah, uh, please. The, the yeah, upside? yeah, please. So the uh, the upside um, is a story. Uh, well, I'll just read the short paragraph 
so the listeners know, will know what I'm talking about from the um, IMDb database. Philip is a wealthy quadriplegic who needs a caretaker to help him with his day-to-day -day routine in his New York penthouse. He decides to hire Dell, a struggling parolee who's trying to reconnect with his ex and his young son. Despite coming from two different worlds, an unlikely friendship starts to blossom as Dell and Philip rediscover the joy of living life to the fullest. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so Philip is very, very wealthy. He lives in a, you know, very fancy, um, you know, Manhattan penthouse. And, uh, and he has basically servants, you know, he has, uh, he's surrounded by three or four people who he pays very well, who take care of his various needs, business and personal needs. He, hi he hired, he needed to hire, he wanted to hire uh, someone else to be a sort of physical, uh, how would you say, caretaker, you know, to help yeah, him. Yeah, physical, uh, yeah. yeah phys you're right. And so he, he winded up um, hiring um, uh, Dell, um, a, you know, a, a black man who uh, didn't even want the job. He was just trying to get signatures uh, for his unemployment, you know, claim to show that he tried to get a job. But anyway, uh, uh, Philip enticed Dell with with a lot of money, and um, and uh, and uh, so my comment, my con here's my concern about the upside. And, and one way you could look at it and say uh, this shows uh, Philip and it shows Dell as very human, you know, people who who desired love. Uh, you know, the qu Philip the quadriplegic had a strong need for, for love and care and connection. And uh, Dell, who was, a, you know, a inner city par parolee, uh, you know, who had lived m uh, much of a, a life of crime, uh, sort of a hardened uh, guy, uh, actually wound up um, being very soft and, uh, and, and able to connect with and develop, a, you know, a, a loving relationship, non-romantic, but a loving relationship with Philip, the, the quadriplegic, but so in a way you could look at that and say that this shows that uh, that all people, even the ones we thought perhaps that were most likely uh, like a quadriplegic or a, a hardened inner city parolee, uh, even they uh, are still want and are capable of love and connection and, and friendship and, right. and that kind of thing. But th something that concerns me about the film uh, is that would this be possible for the average quadriplegic mm -hmm. or the average inner city uh, per, a black so, uh, parolee who didn't have money. It was the money. It was the, <laughs> the extreme amount of money that enabled uh, the quadriplegic to surround himself with people who could uh, who, who, who with who who could provide his help meet his need for connection and friendship. Uh, and uh, it was only because of the uh, off chance that uh, Dell, the parolee, uh, met uh, Philip, who had a lot of money to entice him to uh, go to work, that uh, that that Dell uh, was able to lift himself out of uh, the poverty. So here's m the problem is, and and I think you might um, empathize with this uh, and understand this, Tegan, is for the common person, for the for for, for the vast majority, 99.9 percent .9 of disabled people. And for other uh, underprivileged people, like blacks living in the inner city, who don't have financial resources, are they able? Sure, we agree that they uh, that yeah. they have a need for love and connection like anyone else. But are they able to get it without the privilege? Yeah, um, and that's a, that's a fair question. And actually, as you were saying it, Mikey, I was kind of shaking my head for our listeners who couldn't see that because um, both the films I've suggested <laughs> center around extremely wealthy individuals. And that's a thread within most of the media I've seen in terms of movies um, with people with disabilities. I have like a, a bit of a theory for why why that might be the case. Sure, Nicole, can I just finish this thought real sure. quick? So yeah, what I was going to say is, yeah, people, I mean, <laughs> if if I had, you know, more bills than I do, right? Like I have a substantial savings, but the average person with a disability is not going to be a rich person. 
Hence why I pursue university education to try and better myself that way. But you're quite right. That's not going to be as easily accessible. And you do have to analyze some motive sometimes. Anyway, go ahead, Nicole. Well, um, I wanted to say that I have a bit of a theory for why um, these movies about, you know, the love and disability and inter interabled relationships. And I, I have a theory for why that might, why they might be rich, like the disabled person in that, in that equation. So um, my, I guess that I think the idea of the disabled person being rich romanticizes it because and makes them right. seem more desirable when society views them as the most like undesirable right it's a way to make the viewer not feel as uncomfortable with with view with with that kind of thing that's my theory uh yeah i mean i think i think you're quite right another layer i would put to that is i think in a sense well i feel like i'm is that there is probably a sense of right the rich people because they're rich automatically are assumed to be kind of self-absorbed kind of you know just you know don't really care about the common person and so then the common person comes in and there's this massive transformation and they're like oh wow he does have a soul you know what I mean, or he does have a heart, or whatever. If if you're if you're not into the soul business, but you know what I mean, like 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 it just makes that transformation or the development to that relationship uh, that much more amazing because there's already this assumption, right, in these two movies even that the the people initially come off as super cold and kind of aggressive and just angry mm -hmm. and hating the world. Yeah, but in the uh, in the upside, uh, the uh, main character Philip, the quadru very billionaire quadriplegic, is this very soft-spoken, nice guy. And actually, I do question how many ultra billionaires are like that. It, it, uh, there's no uh, su suggestion of how he got all that money, other than he said, "Well, I, uh, he was some kind of business person." He didn't. Uh, I forgot if they specify the type of business, but I can't imagine a very low-key. Uh, generous, loving, um, almost shy guy acquiring that kind of wealth. When I think of people acquiring huge amounts of wealth, I think of like you know people like like Donald Trump or others who are very abrasive and yeah. aggra aggressive. And uh, I don't have empirical data right now to support my claim, but my claim is, uh, my claim is, uh, my theory is right. My theory, everything starts with a theory. My theory is that of. A very large number of uh, very very well uh, people who have acquired large amount of wealth do so because of aggressive business business practices, and they're not and they're not likely to be uh, very you know, quiet, uh, high highly ethical, uh, loving people. That I could, could be wrong, be, but that's that, my theory. That could be the case. I'll comment on that and I'll say that um, it, it very much so could be the case. I think it's a valid um, theory. Um, what I would say is that um, the things that, you know as a person as a researcher and a person with a background in um, conducting research and looking for all the confounds and all the variables I think that um, what you the people that you see um, you know the rich people in media are the ones that want to be in media and those are the type of people that self-select to be in the media they are the aggressive people that you actually hear about in the news in the in the on TV and there's a, a lot of rich people who just stay very low-key and may not have those personality traits because um, very aggressive people self-select to be um, attention seeking on the media and stuff like that. That could be, that would be part of it. And my, that, that's one, one of my suggestions, I guess the other part of it too, is that um, if the, somebody acquired generational wealth through inheritance, I think they'll be less likely to have those traits because they're not the ones that are going out to generate that income themselves. Right. There's a distinction between um, wealth that one acquired him or herself versus inherited but uh you, you know, the i, I want to you know call call the, up the phrase uh the good guys finish last and uh you know you might not agree that that's uh true but i think uh, there's a lot of truth to that um and I, I think I, I think it's a legitimate question at least it's a legitimate question is it possible or is it likely that in a capitalist society it's possible is it even possible to 
amass large amounts of wealth while being fair and equitable and moral and ethical. I, I think you could make an argument that it's, that it's near impossible. And so that's, if that's the case, or since I tend to subscribe to that theory that it's near impossible, I see a contradiction when I see a film which depicts um, uh, a man who's uh, extremely wealthy, who, who made it the wealth himself through business, and is very ethical and very loving and very soft-spoken and is a quadriplegic and uh, is so available for love and connection. I see it as a contradiction. I could be totally off base, but that's how I see it. Well, I mean, there's way more to respond to there than I can respond to in like four minutes. Um, so I will, I will hold my conversation about capitalism and stuff like that for another day. But what what I will say is I think I think I think you picked up on something, Mikey, that there there's a conflict between the two films I gave you because the me before you film, although Will desires that love, desires that relationship, desires those things, he actively chooses not to. Versus, I think, what's his name? Philip in the upside? Philip decides to, to embrace that, to embrace the, the human connection. He, he doesn't isolate himself. Um, in fact, as him and, and um, Kevin Hart's character, the caregiver, uh, grow closer right there is a scene in there mikey and i want to get get your your take on this if if you recall no worries but there's a scene in there where they're having this big kind of party and stuff like that and and philip calls calls this caregiver into the back room and they're having a bit of an argument and and the caregiver sees that that philip's getting agitated and He's like, I want to break something, and, and 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 so they're both going at it, and the caregiver picks up this vase, and he's like, you want to break this, and he's and Philip's like, yes, yes, I want to break that, and so they go through it, and he just lets out this rage, man, like it's full scale rage, and so it it's it's also an observation of are people with disabilities whether they're rich or not, fully allowed um, to express their emotions sometimes. Because, especially for me physically, right, if you're physically disabled, you may be very reliant on other people for assistance. So verbalizing those emotions, those needs, may not be permitted. <laughs> I don't well, know what... What is what, he? He was uh, a quadriplegic and couldn't even uh, physically display rage, uh, other than uh, you know making throat sounds or yelling. But he actually had to have uh, someone throw things and break. Yeah, he had to have some people break stuff. <laughs> and, then at, and at the end, he's like, "Oh no, he made the mess." And the guy's like, "What?" So, so well, what, yeah, what he was so upset about, uh, and this was uh, one of the plot points in the story. Uh, and this is pertinent to our discussion, actually, um, is uh, that he went on a date with a woman he was interested in and uh, turned out, he found out during the oh, fancy yeah, right. dinner date at an expensive restaurant in Manhattan, oh, it yeah. turned out that she uh, decided that she couldn't be romantically involved with, a, with, with him because he was a quadriplegic and needed to be fed during dinner. And so she wanted to be friends with him. And he was just devastated. He was devastated that he was disqualified from uh, being Dang in a romantic girl. relationship with her because of his physical disability. And he eventually got over it. And, the, and that, that, you know, that, and that's how the story ended. He got over it and, uh, and returned back to his friendship with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, with the, Dell. Uh, with Dell. Um, and he valued that friendship so much. He was able to, uh, you know, yeah. uh, get, get back to his core values of friendship, but he was devastated that he was disqualified by that woman because of his physical condition. Yeah. And, and my last kind of thought here is just the fact that in some senses, 
that situation I think is easier to recover from a little bit uh, in some respects because you know that's the reason. I think for me sometimes it can be hard um, to be turned down and not fully know if that's the reason or not because I'm always in a state of second guessing myself saying was there was there a way I presented wrong or something like that right and so yeah I think like I I haven't been in those situations where I've directly been told yo you're disabled I can't do this let's be friends because I I'd be pretty I'd be pretty sad myself. Um, yeah, well, the thing is, is that she wasn't going to tell him. He 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 uh, extracted it from her. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah. He, yeah, he, yeah. he he checked it out with her. So they were having this beautiful, very romantic dinner. Everything seemed fine. And then he he checked in with her and he said, "Is this more than you expected?" Because she had to feed him every bite. Right, because they because they only had corresponded through letters. That was part of the deal. They right. they had met before. And she was extremely polite and very was being very romantic and you know but but uh, the fact is is that she was she was she was uh you know headed toward a decision that it wasn't going to work for her romantically because she didn't yeah. want to be in a romantic relationship with someone with that uh, t severe physical disability and uh and and he extracted it from her cuz he uh wanted to check it out right and he it was a very uncomfortable scene but he, he she finally admitted it and he was just devastated yeah and so, moral of the story is, romance is hard for everybody. But I think what we wanted to get across in this episode is that, yes, we can, I think we can all agree that people with disabilities have the same needs and desires and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I think that's pretty universally accepted. Um, but I think the issue is whatever your disability is, you're going to face possibly some more challenges um, because there's a real uniqueness to your situation, which is not commonly experienced um, and therefore um, cannot always be commonly empathized with um, because people just don't have a conception of how to work with that, how to be within that. And so I guess uh, my, my final word of advice is, although your disability is part of you, right, it's part of your life, it does not have to define who you are or what you strive to become because the disability is a challenge, yes, but it's also an opportunity which um, which is unique to you. And uh, yeah, and so with that, this has been the Canadian Philosophy Show. I'm Tegan Marshall, your host, here with Nicole Kiergan and Michael Robert Kaditz. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you next week.